has uh, worked this up for us, and I'll let you know to say a few words. But then, sure, they're moving. All right, guys, I'm uh, glad everybody made the switch tonight. Um, this is a familiar sound, uh, surroundings for some of us. We were met here for many years before we had to move away under unfortunate circumstances. But the options are changing, and we have an opportunity now to return here and we'll we'll do this according to procedures and gary gary knows and joe i have to make a did you say anything about joe no i didn't he uh, his wife got has a, has a medical condition and she had a sudden downturn today so joe's staying home with her so he, he couldn't come also uh, chris williams our program guy who who worked with me to get our speaker is uh he's up in new york if, with some family deal so gary and i are running this show have no fear we think we're going to entertain you guys pretty well i would like to introduce uh you to a couple of important people here with wildlife and fisheries it, it, the last one will be our speaker here but i'd like to introduce christy buckler she is the di biologist director is her title for the as a can i say the word chief of inland fisheries. <laughs> so uh, Christy is an important gatekeeper here for any, any, any freshwater fishery issue and, and indeed Robbie is part of that team over here that we were really glad to have her. Uh, she has fly fished in her past and she's interested in joining the club and participating to what she can uh, here and she would like to raise set the system up so we could meet here on a monthly basis. So Christy, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I just want to welcome y'all and make sure you feel at home. And if you need something, let me know. Um, Robbie's the brains of the operation. I'm just the, uh, the driver. It's a scary dog. <laughs> <laughs> she talks um, to the big boss now. That's, that's important. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, really just, I'm really just a country girl really i mean that's that's all i am i uh i'm not fancy at all as you could tell i didn't uh i, I figured i i was dressed nicer till five o'clock but i went for a walk so i changed so i figured you guys would forgive me <laughs> um robbie's official title is uh fisheries technical advisor so he's an considered an expert in the field of fisheries and in, within inland fisheries, um, he calls himself the junk drawer because anything odd that comes along, we just pass it to him and he ends up handling all these weird, crazy things that come up. So he's extremely versatile and knowledgeable. So I know a little bit about a lot of things. So sorry. Well, Christy, I'd like to say one other thing is uh, <coughs> we will, uh, when Joe gets, gets back, we will get together and formalize our return yeah, sure. to wildlife and fisheries here. And we will have to just deal with safety features for coming in the door. And obviously with the value of uh, everything in here, we'll have to do a little careful manipulation, if you will, when we come in and use it and how we get in and leave. But we, we want it to be open to everybody as, as anywhere else. But Chrissy's uh, agreed to meet with us on the Monday nights right now, and uh, we're going to work to find a, a replacement if something happens that she can't yeah. come. I'm here. I, I'm from central Louisiana, and I actually stay here during the week. There's a bunkhouse in the back, and I sleep here during the week. So I'm here Monday through Thursday. Uh, I, leave, I go home late Thursday nights. So I'm we'll here go, anyway, uh, so I don't mind. We'll go ahead and put your title and numbers. I think there, Joe has them and everything. And yeah. That, Christie's available for anybody who's to talk about inland fisheries for that matter. So I'm from Woodworth, which is near Alexandria, if y'all are familiar with it. So yeah, we heard of Woodworth. Haven't gotten tickets there probably. Yeah, probably everybody's got a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's uncle is the mayor, so no. <laughs> that doesn't no. mean you get your ticket fixed. <laughs> 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 I've paid mine too. <laughs> it's either bad relative or bad mayor. <laughs> He's a good mayor. He's a good mayor. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to add just briefly a little bit on for Robbie uh, to add on to what Christy said. You know, he and I are old colleagues. I'm wearing, I'm wearing the Louisiana chapter American Fishery Society hat. 
Robbie is also a AFS Louisiana chapter member, and we've attended many gatherings together. And, and I have an old fish background, as many of you know. So I, I like what, what Robbie wants to do here. And I use some cheat week cheats here, Robbie, so sure. be sure to cover all your and get everybody all adequately excited about what we're going to hear. He specializes in fish identifications, but he doesn't like to to park himself in one group or another. And I I push sunfish on him because I've grown up with sunfish and I've studied them too, but they still are the most challenging for what we can catch as fly fishers. And, and, and Robbie will, will talk about sunfish, but he wants to go a step further and he's got some information I'm, I know will benefit everybody participating in the jambalaya challenge. And of course that means that we know we catch this fish, we're positive what it is, we take a picture of it. We can even be more certain after hear some of, some of Robbie's uh, suggestions of what we can do uh, to make sure what fish we have. Uh, well, I add, I add this, uh, those of you who have ever heard or, or participated in the Master Naturalist programs, the, the one here is run by, run by the Ag Center at LSU. Master Naturalists are people that study all aspects, and Robbie rev regularly talks to them. So he has, he has a real rapport for talking with people who are not specialists in any of the scientific fields. Though he is a scientist, so he does know some basic answers that he can we can we can ask him about, and his goal is to introduce us to some things we may not have thought about, and help us tune our eyes. I like that term, tune. Tune your eyes to better know what to look for to make it when you're making your fish identifications, and so. Uh, I think it's going to be a very helpful presentation as well as just plain interest. Yes. Robbie? Thanks, Dugan. You're welcome. So that was a great introduction. I'll give you a little more background. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, yeah. I don't want to deal with this thing. Um, this is going to be a really for informal, when I say formal, informal uh, discussion on fish. You all have questions, interrupt me. <coughs> I'm going to try to speak normal language. If I say something you don't understand, call me on it. Um, i around fish people all day. And it's easy to lose your lang lose lose what language you're speaking, I guess. Um, a little more history on me. I grew up in Austin, Texas. I was a creek rat in Barton Creek. I went to Texas State University um, to get my undergrad in aquatic biology and my master's degree in aquatic resources, which is just a fancy way of saying aquatic biology. I studied fish. I worked on, I did a lot of field work. We had a huge lab. We helped each other. We went all over the state of Texas, a little invasion of Mexico, some work in Louisiana, Oklahoma, um, in my years out there. And I also worked in river studies at Texas Parks and Wildlife as an intern for three years. 2010, I landed in Louisiana because if you're a fish biologist, odds are you're going to move. So I landed in Lake Charles and I've been there since. <coughs> Came up in the districts and now I have this statewide junk drawer job. I uh, tried to know a little bit about a lot of things. But I am really f passionate about native fish. Uh, I also work with invasives, passionate about native plants and prairie. Um, pretty much the whole naturalist ideal. Um, I abide by it and uh, try to pass it on. So this talk <coughs> is just a little piece. It's kind of the hamburger meat of a large hamburger I give to the Southwest Louisiana Master Naturalists every year. We do, first we do a class on aquatic habitats and vertebrates. And then a week or two later, we do fish. And this is part of a six to eight hour course we teach. It's going to be two or three hours of lecture. But I'll start with, I start with anatomy. And we go all through fish anatomy, internal, external. And fish anatomy is not just here's one fish, here you learn it. Because all fish are very different yet similar. Um, and then we go into biogeography. So we start out with what are the parts of a fish. This is the how to look at fish, figure out what it is. The last part is how did the fish get here? Why are fish where we see them today? <coughs> You're only going to get the middle of that, and um, should take a 45 minutes or an hour. It's going to be kind of loosey-goosey. If y'all want to ask questions, do it. If I go too long, I don't know who's in charge of cutting me off, but give me a sign if we're going too long and shut me up, and I'll wrap it up. Um, we're also going to go over, if you don't have the handouts at the front, there's one on basic external anatomy that our outreach was printing out earlier. 
And my talk is there too, so if you want to take notes in the notes next to the slides, that's how I made it through college. We'll also go through those books. Um, those are the books I lean on to figure out what I'm looking at. And if you notice, it's not just one book. It's a whole stack of them, and that's kind of how we have to do it. <clears throat> Without further ado, uh, let's get started. So I said this is adapted from a Southwest Louisiana perspective. That's because my stomping grounds are really that corner of the state. I live down in Lacassine. Most of y'all, I don't know if any of y'all, does anybody know where Lacassine is? It's where the rum distillery is. So I live right over the Jeff Davis Parish line down here in the Bayou Lacassine drainage. That's the Calcasieu, that's the Mermintal, and there's the Sabine. <clears throat> this is very different from out here. If you look at the state, as you know, well, I won't go backwards. But these aren't connected to the Mississippi River. This is all west. This is the western Gulf Slope. And we've got the red above it, and you've got the Atchafalaya and the Mississippi. What we're dealing with here, east of here, east of Baton Rouge, the Florida parishes are the beginning of the eastern Gulf Slope. The fish assemblage is very different in the eastern Gulf Slope and the western. But it's similar enough where I go out to the Pearl River and I'm catching fish, I know what the genus is. These are fish a lot like what I have back home, but they're just a little bit different. And that's what I want to get y'all to the point of doing tonight. Where you can see this fish, you're like, ah, I'm close. I know what family this is in. I might know the genus. It's not like someone I know, but once you know where you are and what you have an idea of what you're looking at, you hone in. Biogeography is really big. You don't want to ID a fish out in the Amy River that doesn't occur out there and only occurs in southwest Louisiana. You need to know what's supposed to be where you are before you start ID anything, because you'll have like Hudson River fish if you key them out wrong. So hopefully we'll get you uh, kind of tuned up and uh, think along those lines. So here's what we'll do tonight. There's 165 primarily freshwater fish in Louisiana. This is why we can't just do a fish ID course in 45 minutes. Um, 31 of those are urohaline or diadromous. That means they can live in brackish water, salt water, fresh water. That's urohaline. Diadromous means they migrate between fresh and salt water. So you have anadromous fish, which are like salmon or gulf sturgeon or stripers and catadromous fish, which is like the American eel. So catadromous fish grow up in rivers, they swim out to the ocean, they spawn and die. Anadromous fish live in the ocean, usually swim up river, have their babies in rivers. Uh, there's about 26 native, native and introduced families uh, in the fresh waters of Louisiana. And even more if you count fish that sometimes come into fresh waters, like uh, hog chokers, little flounder looking guys. <coughs> So this range from very small fish, the least killy fish, which I have in my ditch, you might have in yours, they're about that big. They also live in my living room in an aquarium, to a huge paddlefish and alligator car. It's one of the biggest fish in uh, at least the southeast. And I'm going to present this in an evolutionary order, because really to get a true understanding, you understand relationships between all these animals. And we're going to see pretty much how fish started and where fish came to, and it's going to repeat. So if you don't buy into evolution, I'm sorry, but this is how I understand things. And the first ones we're going to look at, yeah. Uh, in terms of the number of species, you know where Louisiana ranks? Like I know, I think Alabama is the most. Alabama is yeah. our hot spot of all biodiversity in, this, okay. in the country. I mean, that's if you want to see numbers of plants, herbs, fish, Alabama's the place to go. We have fewer. Yeah, okay. we've. I think Missouri. Close to the there's a fish in Missouri, and they have over 200 species in Missouri. So we don't have as many, um, but that goes back to a lot of biogeography, us being underwater, not having mountains is a big deal. <laughs> um, there's a lot that goes into that. So the first fish we're gonna look at are lampreys. <clears throat> These are basically uh, worms with a um, cranium. They're uh, relatively unchanged for 300 million years, going back into the fossil records. So it's a very, very, very old type of fish. They have protocircle tails. So if we went into the anatomy, if you go to the bottom picture, you see a protocircle tail is basically like a worm tail with fin that goes all around it. It's protocircle, proto being old or original. Um, it's a very ancestral trait. Baby fish have protocircle tails. They grow out of them though. So that's one way you look at embryos or larvae or anything, you can see kind of ancestral traits in those. So baby fish look more like, you know, these guys. They're jawless fish. They don't have a jaw. They don't have a lower jaw. 
Lower jaws come from a pharyngeal arch, which is a gill arch. Our jaw, our voice box, those are all gill arches that have <coughs> changed. These guys still have a gill arch where that gill arch is. They don't have a jaw. They have a sucker mouth. So they have larval forms. Um, this is what I usually see if we electrofish in a river and we uh, shock up a bunch of them, they'll come out of the leaf, leaf litter and the sand. They look like a bunch of little worms. They're about that big, they come up. There's two types. There's brook lamprey, which uh, they're amacetes, which is larval form, for three or four years. So three or four years, there's little worm looking thing feeding, filter feed. Um, they don't feed as adults. After three or four years, they go through a metamorphosis. They turn into an adult form, which is the second one down. So the top's an amacetes, it's a little tiny thing. That's a brook lamprey on the rocks. Turn into an adult form, they don't eat as adults. They swim around, they get in these congregations. You can actually see them, I know up in Kasachi, probably some of the Florida parishes in the clear, I mean, I'm talking shallow, shallow water. They have breeding congregations. They crawl each other, spawn, they die. Chestnut lamprey you don't see as often. I've only seen one um, alive in my life. <clears throat> that's uh, the one that's parasitic. That's the big sucker mouth there and the one that's hooked onto that striped shiner. That's a chestnut lamprey. You can see spots on fish from where they suck on spots. They're a parasite. They live five to seven years as amacetes, so they're, and they look identical to the other species. Because <laughs> the theory is, I could not, I've tried and tried to tell them apart as, as larvae. You can't um, without genetics. The theory is the brook lamprey is like a, they don't fully, form, they're, an un, they're not a fully formed chestnut lamprey. So the fact that they turn into adults, don't feed, they spawn, they die. A chestnut lamprey keeps going, and they turn into a feeding form. So they can also live, after five or seven years in leaves, they can live for another seven to nine years as a parasite swimming around. A big parasitic, well, big for a parasitic fish, swimming around sucking on whatever comes by. Um, pretty fascinating fish, very ancient. They don't leave a lot of fossils because they uh, are car cartilaginous. But the next ones we'll look at are sturgeon and paddlefish. Um, this is uh, order Acipenseriformes. <clears throat> They're in different families, but uh, I think they might be in the same family. But um, they're cartilaginous, just like the uh, lampreys. We think they used to have bones, and they lost them over time because cartilage is lighter, more flexible, doesn't take as much energy to make. They have a spiral valve intestine, um, which <clears throat> is really just a modified. Their intestine looks like a tube with a like a a swirly <coughs> slide going down it. Instead of a whole bunch of intestines, it has more surface area. And, they're, and uh, they eat invertebrates, they're filter feeders, so they're taking all those bugs and they're slowly going down that tube. Uh, they, have big, they have a heterocircle tail, so we had that protocircle tail where the fin went all the way around the tail. These are like a shark tail. I don't know, you can't really see it well on here, but the, the notochord or the fleshy part of their backbone or spine goes up into the upper part of their tail, just like a shark. And the lower part of the tail is just a fin. So it has more, I guess, stability, and it has more uh, complexity than a protocircle tail, so they have more control, but it's not as streamlined as some other fish we'll be looking at. It's a very ancient form of tail. So sturgeon have been around for about two, 250 million years or so, since so it's Triassic. Um, we don't have any sturgeon in southwest Louisiana, but out here, <coughs> You've got shovel nose, pallet, and gulf sturgeon. Um, gulf are more in the Pearl River and Boca Chitta, and they're ones that live out in the ocean. They're um, anadromous. They're adult, pig adults that live out in the ocean, they swim up the river, spawn, and die. Or they don't die, they spawn, they swim back out. They live a long time. Pallet sturgeon and shovel nose, they have migrations, but it's in, within the river, within the Mississippi River. Um, they're big for caviar. That's where your beluga caviar is coming from, Russian sturgeon. Uh, paddlefish is something we do have statewide. They're uh, more recently on the scene. They came in the Cretaceous about 75 million years ago. Their young look just like a sturgeon. See how the sturgeon has those barbels, the whiskers hanging down? A young paddlefish has little barbels and whiskers. They lose them when they grow up and they grow that big rostrum. But a paddlefish, you can tell because they have the big paddle, the big rostrum. Um, there are only two types in the world. The Chinese one is just declared extinct. So we have the American paddlefish, it's all that's left. They're big river fish. Um, they have spawning migrations, we catch them. We'll be out there in 
couple weeks in Bayou Nepique out by my house catching paddlefish in their spawning run to take them up to the hatchery where we spawn them for school kids. Um, they also have a, a caviar fishery, but we don't in Louisiana. Um, they take seven to ten years to mature and they can live for decades and decades after that. This is a fish that's really easy to wipe them out because the females only spawn every two or three years. Males are going every year. Um, if you take females out of the population or they don't have flood pulses to go spawn, they won't spawn and they'll dwindle out. And be extirpated. But they're huge filter feeders. What's cool about them is they swim around with their mouth open like a basking shark or something, and they just suck in everything they swim by. <coughs> Do y'all use a net to catch them or electrofish? We're using gill nets. Okay. We set them and they have like what we call bobbers, big floats on them. <coughs> and we can either see them floating or we run them every two hours. And are they legal to stag like certain times? <coughs> You can you cannot target them by snagging. Okay. If you snag one, if you want to get a picture, get it very quickly. Get a picture of yourself releasing it if you snag <laughs> one's a safest way to do it. I Don't get on in some states people fish for them that way, right? They get other states blow it down. we yeah. you can keep two under thirty inches a day caught through the mouth. Hmm. Which being filter feeders is really hard to catch through the mouth. Yeah. People catch them on trial lines sometimes. If you wanted a fly that looked like a school of plankton that put up electricity, <laughs> you could maybe catch them. Because they use that rostrum, that big nose they have, is, is full of electrosensors. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. So in water that's chocolate milk, turbid, they can still sense clouds of food all around them and target it. <coughs> Sorry. I had this thing a month ago and it's just lingering. But they have little tiny eyes too. You can tell they live in big, muddy water. They don't see that well at all. But, um, People also call them spoonbill cats. You'll know it if you catch one, because you'll say, what is this alien looking creature on the end of my line? Uh, gar. These are another, it's a Cretaceous fish. Pretty much everybody in here probably knows what a gar looks like. Um, big sharp teeth, ganoid scales. They have extremely heavy armored scales that are actually used for armor. Uh, they have a physostoma swim bladder. So that means they have basically lungs. They're vascularized. You cut open a gar, they're going to have very bloody looking lungs in them. Um, a swim bladder is just how a fish stays buoyant, or an air bladder. It's what our lungs are. It's the same organ. Most fish that we'll be looking at later have a physoclistus swim bladder, so it's separate. It doesn't have a tube going to their mouth. Um, so you can drown a gar. I've drowned a gar by accident in nets. If you have low oxygen water and you keep them underwater, they'll drown. Uh, they spawn generally in vegetation and floodplains. They have toxic eggs. Their eggs are very toxic to birds. So if we put up a batcher on the Mississippi River, cut down flooding, um, put levees up, you really hurt gar populations. Gar do very well in Louisiana. We have like the stronghold of most gar here, especially South Louisiana, because there's a lot of flooded grassland. So the big one, alligator gar, uh, they get up to 10 feet long, 300 plus pounds. You usually don't see them that big. Um, they live 25 to 50 years, I imagine longer, um, if they weren't a big trophy. They have two rows of teeth, so if you pop, a, this is a real key characteristic, especially on small ones, you pop their mouth open with your knife, or a stick or something, you'll see they have two rows of teeth. Very good characteristic go on. They're highly predatory. They're garbage disposals of fish. They'll eat anything that comes in the water, but they will not bite humans. They're not dangerous. I've been saning, capturing four to five foot alligator guard ponds at LSU. And all you do, you want to wear pants because they'll swim by you and accidentally cut you by brushing on you. But I've never seen one bite somebody that wasn't really messing with it. They actually turn into logs when you catch them. Um, Louisiana is really the last big stronghold of alligator guard in the country. If you look at the historic range, they've been wiped out throughout Tennessee, the northern part of the range, because of those levees and all the other factors. Yeah? Been fishing rockfield wildlife at a younger day, mm -hmm. and those were the biggest alligator gar I have ever seen. But they never got 10 feet and 300 pounds. So, where are these 10 feet, 300 pound? A alligators? monster came out. Was that the red recently? The Red River had a monster in it. Um, the Trinity River in Texas is the well known gar fishery. Um, guides go out there and specifically target them. And wow. they're so smart, too. I mean, to get that big and that old, I've been pike fishing, it's the same way. If you want a big pike, you have one shot to fool it, but once they figure it out, you're done for the day. So with the gar, they set those hooks with shad or whatever on them, they leave that bend. They, and they use have alarms so on they them. Or they use this stainless steel loops to catch, catch in between. I think they're using hooks, but I'm not sure. 
The guys at Rockefeller had, some of them were using these slip nets with stainless steel and they put a piece of uh, bait on the bottom part mm -hmm. and when it would pull in it blew like a lasso. Yeah, yeah. And we'd catch them. And, and those things were, uh, they weren't 300 pounds, they weren't close to that, but they were about five feet yep. long and they were about that big around. Yep. I'm sure they were in the 100 pound plus or minus category. That's the most gar I've ever seen, alligator gar I've ever seen is Rockefeller, right after a thunderstorm. We had to get off the water because we were about to get struck by lightning. And we went right out after that. It looked like dolphins <coughs> surfacing all over, but it was alligator gar, as far as you can see. It was cool. <clears throat> but uh, like I said, yeah, they in Louisiana, we have the largest, most stable population. We have a large commercial fishery farm in Louisiana, too. So, so. And as far as we can tell, it's sustainable. We've got short-nosed gar. This is one of the easiest ones to confuse with an alligator gar, especially small ones. <clears throat> they have a partial row, a partial second row of teeth. So if you open their mouth, it's not going to be a full row. It'll be a really reduced row of uh, teeth. They're not heavily patterned. They have a little pattern on the tail. That's that top one. So it does look superficial like an alligator gar. Spotted gar are going to be heavily spotted. Um, have spots on their pectoral fins. Long nose gar are the ones with the long noses. And you can see the, the, um, the comparison down in the bottom left. That's just the different head shapes they have. A long nose gar is obviously long. It will have spots too, but it's not going to have that really short nose on it. And it's because they're piscivorous, which means they eat fish. If you see something with a really long, skinny snout, chances are they're grabbing fish with it. These other gars, they eat a lot of fish, but they're generalists. They just whatever gets by them. And that's a little, that's a, a uh, comparison of their sizes to that kind of bottom middle picture. And to the right, that's a, I went to school, grad school with her, that's the Pecos River. And that was, at the time, one of the largest long-nosed gars I've ever seen. I've seen them bigger up in Anacoco Lake now. <clears throat> so bowfin. On, so, the, on the gar, yeah. on the small alligator gar and short-nosed gar, is there any external features to identify the two? Their, their heads are going to look slightly different. They're going to have a different ratio of width to length. What that ratio is, I'm not sure. That's something you're looking at key for. Um, but yeah, there's ways to see it. Really, if you have a good long knife or a stick, just propping their mouth open and looking. Is, that's how I would do it, to confirm. And gars can hybridize too. It's super rare, but they can. So, bowfin, <coughs> this is already out of date. I'm saying it's the last surviving member of a uh, family dating back to the Jurassic. They're doing a lot of work on bowfin, on morphometrics, which is the measurements, which is looking at fin placement, scale counts, ratios in their body. That's how we used to ID all fish before we had genetics. You had to just do lots of measurements to find average measurements and counts. But it's turning out that I think a paper came out, I forget how many species they've broken into now, maybe four, three or four, but I hear talk of there might be seven species of bowfin in America. And I think we might have three in Louisiana if they ever do officially break them out in a you know, reviewed paper. If you just threw one in front of me, I couldn't tell you which one it was. They all look very similar. If you threw them all out on the gradient of where they are, you could probably see differences. Like I hear the Red River ones are kind of long and skinny. Um, just little stuff like that. But genetically, they are distinct too. They also have ganoid scales, like a gar. It's not as heavy, but they have good <laughs> thick scales. They have really cool parental care. Um, that's a male down at the bottom. You can tell a male from a female if only a male is going to have a cloud of babies around. Those are babies around. He's guarding them. That's the only time one of these will really uh, unprovoked, unprovoked, maybe come after you because he's guarding his babies. I wouldn't want to get bit by one. But the males in this time of year will turn green. And they'll have, you can see a spot on its tail. Um, only the males get that eye spot on their tail. And the females get bigger. They're usually more drab in color, but I mean, a big bowfin would be like that. Uh, they do have a guller plate. So this is the only fish we have out here with a guller plate. So if you look under their chin, they have a plate. And that plate gives them crunching power and smashing power. That's why you don't want to put your hand near their mouth, other than the teeth. They, they're pretty toothy, but they have a very powerful bite. They're ambush predators, sluggish waters. Um, they also have a physostomus swim bladder, so they breathe air. These live, I've got a ditch. We have two and a half acres and a border of my property is an irrigation ditch. It's not pumped anymore. It's the headwaters of Bayou Lacassine. We have 13 types of fish in it that I sample every year. Go check them out. <coughs> we have bowfin in water that's about that deep. And we'll have pairs of them in my ditch, which is pretty shocking the first time you 
put electricity on a bow fit in knee deep water, kind of blow up on you. But very cool fish. I know they're very underappreciated. Um, might break a fly rod, but it'd be fun. American eel, this is one of my passions. Um, I've done a lot of research in the past on American eels. I'm in like international working groups now on American eel. I love working with these things. It's one of the biggest fish in America we know the least about. Um, this is something you could catch and it'd be a pretty fun catch. You wanna catch them on, uh, they like shrimp, they like crawfish. And they have a good sense of smell, so if you could rub a little shrimp on a shrimp fly. <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these actually have a better sense of smell than catfish. So they're very, very sensitive to smells. Uh, they're not that visual in um, hunting. But they're catadromous. So these guys spawn out where that blue circle is in the Sargasso Sea. They spawn, they die. Their babies, that's a chart of their babies in the middle in the black. The ones that look like knife blades are called leptocephalus. So that leptocephalus larva will drift from Nova Scotia and Canada all down the eastern seaboard to the northern banks of South America. That's their range. And it's one population, you've proven it by genetics. The ones in Canada come from the same broodstock as the ones in Louisiana, come from the same ones in Costa Rica. Um, they might have other places they spawn, but we don't know. We only tracked the first one actually swimming out there to spawn in 2015 for the first time. Arkansas, um, we're working with a guy named Jeff Quinn who works for the state agency up there. He's tagging silver eels, which are mature eels, and they're tracking them coming through Louisiana to swim out to the ocean and spawn. The fastest one we've seen swam from the Arkansas border to Oregon City in five days down the Washita, down the Washita and then the Chafalaya. We're seeing almost 100% make it that are swimming it. So it's one of the great world migrations. People talk monarch butterflies and ducks and geese. American eels are one of the great world migrations. It's actually really at risk. So their life cycle, it started out as a leptocephalus, that looking knife blade. They hit the coast and turn into a glass eel, which is exactly what it sounds like. It looks like a little glass piece of spaghetti. They actually, we have never caught glass eels in Louisiana on record. They never caught them in Texas until last month, about a month ago. They're setting eel ramps after six or seven years of trying to catch them. They finally figured out the ramp to use on the coast of Texas. Um, where they've caught 19 last I saw. And I was at a conference where we were talking about it a week and a half ago. So it's big, big news in the eel world. Um, then they hit the coast of the last eel. They turn into an elver, which gets pigment. It's a little eel, little spaghetti looking thing with pigments in elver now. It's about 10 centimeters. Then they swim upstream as a, a yellow eel. And that's what you catch. If you catch them either on the coast or inland, odds are it's what we call a yellow eel. Even if she's that big, a female will be over four, 40 centimeters is the cutoff. Males don't get bigger than 40 centimeters. If anything bigger is a female, odds are she's still mature. People say, I caught an adult eel. You can have one that's, that's big around as my arm, that big, and she's still a baby. Because what happens is they turn into a silver eel. Their eyes get really big. They get big lateral line pores on their side. They start to consume their guts, and they swim out to the ocean Hopefully at the same time, meet up with somebody else who's a big spawning congregation. They spawn, they die. And they well, become, wait a minute. Hmm? I'm out of, they don't do this instantaneously, right? You don't go from yellow to silver, go outside and die. They gotta have some kind of a... They, okay, so there's, it, uh, down here, from what we found in our research, most seals are living eight or nine years inland. Because we see a real drop off after about eight years and the age of eels we're catching. Because we age them with their ear bones, they're odorless. We can pull those out and tell you how many years it's been in the continental age, how long they've been inland. It can be a long process. So Jeff has tagged silver eels that didn't get the spawning cue. So if they don't get a flood pulse, that happens usually in December, January. They don't get that flood pulse, they hang out. So they're not consuming all their guts or anything at once. They'll have the bigger eyes, they'll be silvered, but they're still sitting there feeding. Sometimes they move and they don't get enough of pulse and they'll, we have one that's hanging out at Morgan City. And sometimes they wait for the next year, and then they get the cue. The bottom line is you're telling us they don't have very much length in their mature category. No, they're, they're mature from what we're seeing at most, but usually a season to maybe a little over a year. And then they go out and have their fling, and that's it. That's it. That's all they're living for. But until then, they're mostly eating crawfish, shrimp. They eat whatever comes by, <coughs> but most of their stomachs have crawfish in them. Um... I wrote dams on there because that's the biggest threat to them since they're this big migratory fish. 
The dams over 100 feet tall are impassable. They pile up below Toledo Bend. Um, we have stunted eels that are in the highest densities we see in the state. But we have a whole different ballgame down here. We don't have the densities they have up on the eastern seaboard. We're just trying, we're excited to catch 19 glass eels. They have in Virginia dams where they put, they put ramps on for eels to get over dams and they can count them. Some of these dams are counting 600, 700,000 glass eels going over. They've got a fishery in Maine and South Carolina. South Carolina is dwindling. But Maine, the glass eel fishery, if you listen to the news every year, it might be in the spring when they're coming in. I can't remember the exact time here. They have a window they can fish them. But those things go for $2,000 plus a pound. And there's guys making easy six digits in a season. There's all kinds of black market and thievery and crime around that kind of fast money. And I'm glad we don't have it here because <coughs> it'd be a mess. What do they do with the glass eels? So, get this. So, get them, they'll have their quota, which would be hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially. They sell them to China. China raises them up in ponds and sells them back to Japan and America. So if you go to a sushi place and you get eel, I don't have any like confirmation of this, but I suspect it was probably an American eel that was caught in China, raised and sent back. And people are making money hand over fist every part, every part of that process. Thing is, European eels um, are extremely endangered, even more so than American eels because they've been damning their luck. Um, they have a lot more history of damming their rivers. We've only been doing it for, what, 300 years? <laughs> They've been doing it for thousands of years, potentially, out there. Um, and they have major history eel fisheries. So European eels are completely illegal. They leak into the market, but after European eels became illegal, they started leaning more on American eels. And there is a yellow eel fishery all up and down the East Coast. So they're selling the you know larger eels, too, for bait and for food. But... Um, it's a true American treasure that most people don't respect or uh, really give them their due. But it's an amazing fish. There are, you can look on Google Maps up in New York and some of the original colonies, and you can see original hundreds of year old eel traps. And people still maintain some of them. They look like chevrons, like V's going up the river. And those are eel traps from hundreds of years ago, a lot of them. Uh, shad. This is not a real glorious family of fish. They're, uh, I dare say, maybe my least favorite fish is the gizzard shad for native fish, but they're very important. They're prized game fish forage. Many a pond or lake can be made or, break with, made or broken with shad. Good shad populations generally equal good bass populations, good predator populations. Um, they have an extreme slime defense. And my hatred of gizzard shad is really learned because I have set gill nets in places in grad school we probably shouldn't have and we probably drank a little too much the night before and we're on a 12 foot john boat picking probably hundreds of pounds of gizzard shad out in the first part of the day which is not fun um, and they're extremely slimy people do develop an allergy to them sometimes which i never did unfortunately it's a good excuse to get out of picking them um, they're extremely sensitive to oxygen we get fish gills on shad all the time if the oxygen dips a little bit You'll probably see shad floating up one type or another, or pogies, um, menhaden. We've got five, five types in Louisiana. Gizzard shad is the big one. The ones that get big. Um, it's a big fishery for crawfish bait, and shad seeing, shad dipping. Um, they're more or less filter feeders. If you uh, threadfin shad are the next ones that look a lot like a gizzard shad, so I'm just going down these pictures. Gizzard shad, threadfin shad look a lot like a gizzard shad, but they don't get that big. The trick to tell them apart is the thumb trick. If you catch a shad about that big and don't know what it is, run your thumb down its nose. If its mouth pops open, it's a threadfin shad. If your thumb just runs straight down and you're not touching your mouth, you have a gizzard shad. Eventually, you'll learn to do them without braille. But um, you can see it there too. The threadfin shad has a, what we call a, a terminal mouth that sticks straight out. And the gizzard shad has a tub subterminal mouth that's down below. Um, Skipjack herring, that's another weird one. We get questions about these, like once a year, I get a text or an email saying, I caught this thing, what is this? Skipjack herring, it's a type of shad. It's the third one down. Um, they're migratory, they have runs, and uh, they pop up on the end of a hook sometimes. It's a beautiful golden fish. <coughs> it's a herring. 
The really rare one is the Alabama Shad. That's the next one down. If I was handed an Alabama Shad and a Skipjack herring, I couldn't tell you which was which. I've never seen an Alabama Shad in person. We know they're in Louisiana because they live out in the ocean and then they uh, swim up to uh, Arkansas, up the, uh, the Washita River. They have records of them in Washita. That guy's tagging the eels. Wants to tag Alabama Shad so we can actually get records of them coming through Louisiana so we can monitor their migration. We know they come through here. Most people, there's a name for them. I'm gonna write it. Skip, Christy, do you know the name of Skipjack Herring, what they call them up in like the central part of the state? They, uh, they have a name for them, and they, I think they mix up Alabama Shad, Skipjack Herring, same genus, they're almost identical, and we have a very generic name. They say up there they're catching, it might be Skipjacks, but I don't think it is Skipjacks. <clears throat> so we don't have a lot of records. We don't have any records in Louisiana. Hopefully we'll get them soon. But they are extremely imperiled because of dams and all the usual suspects, habitat issues. Then we have the Gulf Menhadens. Um, so on the bottom, pogies, huge commercial market for them. Also extremely sensitive to low oxygen. Um, on the coast, if you live south of I-10, closer to the coast, um, you have a hot, cloudy day or a big rainfall event, a lot of times you have pokey kills. If you ever pop their mouth open, you should do it. It's really impressive. It's a huge filter feeding mouth. That's how you would tell a pogey from everything else, is that mouth is just unmistakable. It's monstrous. So we're gonna get into a group of fish that most people don't lump together, but they are. Um, minnows, suckers, and catfish. They're actually very similar to each other. Um, what they're called is Austereophysians, which has the word stereo in it, and that's how you remember it. So they have this thing called a Weberian apparatus. It's a modified vertebra that taps on a, let's see, I think it taps near their skull, and it taps through their swim bladder. So, I don't know, walk over here. <coughs> You have a swim bladder here. That's full of air. It's a physis clistus swim bladder. It's not attached to things. It's just like an air balloon in the fish. Helps them stay buoyant. Sound comes through here. It's coming through the water. Amplifies in here. Hits this thing. I think it's that. Which acts as like an anvil kind of thing. I don't like how your eardrum works. But it's hitting their skull. So it's a sound amplifier built into them. So this, these are the only fish that I know of, minnow, suckers, catfish, that have this Weberian apparatus, this amplifier. And why do they do it? They do it because they communicate. You call catfish, they talk to each other, they'll talk to you. Um, suckers can grunt. Minnows actually have really complex languages. Like you can ID minnows by sound. I, I know a woman that went to Auburn and learned fish sounds. And she just recorded at whatever frequency fish click in and talking to each other, rumbling, grumbling, clicking. Because they're all mostly very highly social. Social animals communicate. Um, they know each other. So here's the big one. Um, if you're into micro fishing, you're going to need to brush up on a whole lot if you're catching minnows. Minnows are not easy. I used to be really good at minnow ID in Texas. Um, I'm rustier now. It takes me a couple of handfuls of fish to kind of knock the, knock, knock the rust off and get back into minnow ID. The trick with, well, with minnows, now they're lucicity. You talk to the old fish biologists, they call them Suprinids. That's the old family. Suprinidae got broken up into like 19 families. So in my lifetime, we've changed the family of minnows in America. And I hear it might change back. But they're a very diverse group. There's 45 species of minnows in Louisiana. You're not going to have 45 species in any one river. I um, can't remember. In southwest Louisiana, we're looking at 20-something. They have various food and breeding strategies. Uh, you name it, they can fit it in their mouth, they can eat it. Most are insect eaters, though. Um, people think there are a lot more algae-eating fish than there are. Most, it's very rare to have an, a fish that actually eats algae. In that ecosystem, it's bugs are eating algae, and then fish are usually eating bugs or other fish. <clears throat> and breeding strategies, you have nest guarding, you have egg scattering, you have ones that make nests, you have ones that just forget their babies, it, you name it, they do it. Um, not as much as cichlids, but it's pretty complex breeding strategies. Some are migratory. We have some minnows that are highly migratory. Like I, out where I live, I can go catch Mississippi silvery minnows in the summer on their run going up the Calcasieu. If we go out there a week or two, or a month or two later, you're probably not gonna see many. 
Um, some are very good bioindicators, so they're very sensitive. Some are tough as nails. You want the toughest nail one in your pond. Um, so the things to look for. This is a long list. So when I look at a minnow, what's going through my brain, if I'm on my A game, look at mouth position, eye size and position, pigmentation. We always joke, uh, kill it for positive ID, because a lot of times you catch a minnow, it'll just be straw colored. If they die, or if they're put in different conditions, a lot of times the melanin and the black will come out, and you can ID them by the black markings on them. Um, fin positions and shapes, scale size and shape. There's a type of minnow called the mimic shiner, which is really tough, and you look at the scales on the lateral line, and they're raised. So this is a fish that's this big, an inch and a half, two inches. And my eyes are getting worse, 41 now, so they're not as sharp as they used to be. But when I was young and sharp, I could just look at one and see those raised scales in the sun. It's uh, harder now, I might have to pop a contact out to see one. But uh, pharyngeal teeth, so I talked about your voice box and this being old gill arches basically. Pharyngeal teeth are too. All fish have it. So if you ever watch fish eat, they don't chew with their lips, they don't chew with the teeth on their mandibles, they're chewing in their throat. So they have sets of teeth in their throat. And some minnows for positive ID, you get in there and you pull those teeth out of their throat through their gills. Um, obviously, you want to be dead to do that. And that is, there's an art to that. Um, ratios. A lot of fish ID, when it comes down to stuff like this, is ratios. The eye goes one and a half times into the snout. Um, it's five times as long as it is tall. Stuff like that. If you look in some of these fish ID books, they're really big on ratios. Um, and the key, I don't know why I put this on, the drainage basin. That should be the first. You should know what is where you're trying to ID something so you don't go down those wrong paths and ID something that's totally not relevant. Um, usually, and this is not just minnows, this is most fish, there's three to five traits that will set that species of fish apart from all the others in that combination. So I brought all these books. That's how I learned field ID. I'm not being a salesman here, but uh, so it's freshwater fish to Texas. For many groups, it's relevant out here, and for many groups, it'll at least get you close to what you're looking at. Um, this goes coast to coast in Texas, or uh, river to river, I guess. And really, the Sabine River, Calcasieu River, Mermental River, they have the same fish. You know? Red River is covered in this. So you're good, really, on the western half of the state with this book. But it's written by Chad Thomas, who was our, when I was in grad school, he was our lab tech. He taught me how to feel ID fish. Tim Bonner was my major professor. And Bobby Whiteside was a professor before Tim Bach. So it's written by pretty esteemed people, and it just has really good information, comments to say what other things could look at. But they do go by the characteristics. So this is a dollar sunfish. It has six characteristics to ID this one fish. And if you really dig into it, a few of those will set it apart, really, from the long ear sunfish. So start being a fish, and as a whole, you end up learning to recognize them like faces. But cue in on those traits that you know set it apart from something else. This is just a bunch of fish that are in southwest Louisiana, most of which are also found in this part of the state. Um, you might catch, if you're fly fishing or micro fishing, you might catch striped shiners in that middle column on the bottom. That's a big <coughs> shiner. Um, they don't always, that's a breeding male, they don't always look like that, but they have a series of lines down their back that you can really tell, but they're, that early picture with the lamprey on it with the sucking onto a fish, that lamprey is that big sucking onto one of those guys. So it's a big minnow. You mentioned something about them being social, or uh, I've actually had uh, the black tail shiner, I mean, I, I guess just snagged them, but I mean, the fishing of Stream or fly that's as big as them, yeah. they will go, I don't know, attack it or try and yeah, make friends with it. They can be but aggressive and they yeah. get, black tail shiners get pretty big too. Yeah, we catch those on yeah. small flies. They'll get that kind of hook mouth too, kind of like a big salmon gets. Oh, really? The I, big black tail will get huh. that. After Hurricane Rita, they have massive fish kills on Sabine. Just like we have massive fish kills all over after hurricanes. But I was there the year after when I was an intern. And those are some of the only fish we caught gar and black tail shiners. But there's nothing eating them, so they're like just magnum <laughs> size. I think we hit world records that year. Here's some cool fish you're going to get out here. Florida parishes through uh, the Pearl River. <coughs> that one on the top left is a beautiful fish. I actually was honored to go catch them a couple months ago. It's extremely rare in the state. It's called Pteranotropus wallaca. It's a uh, blue nose shiner. This is a fish in a very specific habitat. 
sluggish pools of grass. We only know of like two sites in the state where they occur. They occur a lot more in Mississippi. But if you're standing on a bridge in the sun, you can see their blue noses below you swimming around. And you catch them, they have like gold leaf across them. They look like an aquarium fish. Super rare though. There's another relative of that in the red and Washita drainage is called the blue head shiner. Um, you might run by creek chub, somatolus. Somatolus is a big minnow that is a piscivore. They're kind of like the bass of minnows. And when you get a big one, they got a big mouth on them. It's a beefy looking fish that you can see eating other fish. <laughs> that is probably one you run by micro fishing. Put blue head chub on there on the bottom left. That's a big fish. This one, if you ever look it up, that's a male with the big horns in his head. Those are called nuptial tubercles. So those are like really a hot item when they have those going on. They turn blue, their head blows up, and they get horns all over them. And that's just when they're spawning? That's they breeding get, condition. And you can, those horns will fall off. You'll see like kind of scars on their head when they fall off. But that fish gets big. It's a big minnow. You'll see pictures of them holding rocks in their mouths. They clear out spawning beds, and they, they move rocks around. Um, it's a vertebrae too. Uh, on the bottom right is a flag fin shiner, just another beautiful fish related to the one on the top left that you find out in this part of the state. So minnows aren't always small. Though those two folks on the left are holding golden shiners and they get bigger than that. Golden shiners get like that big. Um, that was the stumper fish when I took ichthyology. We had 50 fish laid out and we had this minnow that's this big on a table. And you go, what is that thing? Um, you'll see those a lot more in ponds, lakes. Um, certain years you'll see a whole bunch. Those others used to be minnows. That's a carp, common carp and a grass carp. They used to be in the minnow family. They've split them out. They're in a different family now. So they're, they're actually in Suprinity. So Suprinity is old world carps now. Leucicity is new world carps. Then we also have the uh, invasive carps. Asian carp, invasive carp. These are the big jumping carp. Um, silver carp, big head carp, grass carp, and black carp. Um, they get huge. These pictures, all those pictures in the field are work we're doing with LSU. That big head carp was at Davis Pond. We tagged it and it swam off. Um, we're tagging them and watching how they move <coughs> south Louisiana, between the Mississippi and the Calcasieu, south of the intercoastal. We're picking them up, going through Vermilion Bay, changing basins. Um, we're picking up fish from, we're picking up grass carp from Iowa in Morgan City. Pretty amazing how these things move. It's all interconnected. These are the ones that will knock you out of the boat, break your jaw, um, cause lots of problems. They are edible. They're delicious if you cook them right. Um, you can snag them. People snag them. Um, there's videos all over YouTube on how to do it. Um, and much of their home range, ironically, they're critically imperiled. So you might have a, a market for Chinese, and they have poked around to catch them here and send them back to China because they like eating them there. And they've dammed up all their big rivers, and they don't have these big migrations. Same reason they don't have paddlefish, they don't have these. Uh, we did grow, I can't remember, it might have been Minnesota or Michigan. They caught the world record big head carp as an invasive species in the United States. So we can grow them out here. Um, we're doing lots. There's lots of money to research them, um, trying to find ways to control them, find out what their impacts are, find out where they're going. We're doing a lot of research on those in the state. They're, I hate them, but I have lots of respect for them. They're an amazing fish. Yeah. What's that? What is the research? Uh, we're looking. We have fish data. This is. We have a few studies that are coming online. The one that's happening right now. We have fish data in the Chafalaya Basin before and after they showed up in the 90s. And we're looking at their impacts on uh, big mouth buffalo because they share food targets. Big mouth buffalo are also one of the biggest commercial fish in the state for uh, crawfish bait. And we're also looking at impacts on largemouth bass, which are further up the food chain. Um, and really because largemouth bass, you could have a cascade if they're impacting eating all the plankton impacting fish in between uh, bass are eating, we would see that in their weights or the growth rates. Um, and it's also a huge recreational fish. As far as we can tell, I don't have preliminary results from that. And they're also looking at stable isotopes and some other factors. But uh, if you go out and just do fish science, our fish in the Chafalaya Basin aren't stunted. They're not skinny. We don't have crazy population shifts. Like in Oakland, Illinois, when these carp showed up, they would wipe out native species, and the ones that were left were skinny and not doing well at all. 
And a lot of that's kind of leveled out. Why isn't bases how it boom and then they kind of ease out and then things learn to eat them and learn to work around them? We just haven't seen those major impacts down here. So we want to know if there are measurable impacts. Because um, we can go around acting like they're the worst thing ever, but if there's no measurable impact, you know, are we spending our resources the right way to combat it? But there is a market for them. We're also in developed markets. Um, we've talked to cosmetic people, catfish feed, there's active studies going on with nutritional values, contaminants. Um, our carp down here, Illinois, what they're bringing into market are like this, ours are like this. And ours are a lot oilier. They have a much higher oil content, which is apparently good for fish feed. Um, we'll wait for the contaminants to come in, though. That could be interesting. Suckers. Um, carp are not suckers. Carp, like we said, are minnows. Printers are old world minnows. Suckers, some can be very easily confused with minnows or minnows that look a lot like suckers. Um, we have suckers in Catastomidae in, in Asia and North America. They have a subterminal mouth. So their mouth is downturned because they're sucking on the bottom. Um, their lips in a lot of these are used for ID. If you get out east, they have a lot of sucker species. I and mean, you flip them over and you look at the creases and the curves and the shapes of their lips, and that's how you tell them apart. So they eat benthos and detritus, which means they're eating <coughs> sometimes rotting stuff, but a lot of worms and bugs that live in the bottom. Suckers are not algae eaters. They might suck up some algae while they're trying to get their favorite foods, but they're not targeting algae. One thing you can also tell the fish, you cut them open, look at their stomachs, um, or I mean their intestines. It has a really long, windy intestine, like a Rio Grande cichlid or a Mississippi silvery minnow, which also, look, Mississippi silvery minnows look like potbelly minnows, I like to call them that. They have this huge intestine. Those are some of the rare um, algae eaters or plant eaters. Most fish have just a simple, like, S-shaped intestine because it's got meat passing straight through it. These guys included. Um, some get really large, I mean, buffalo can live decades, 100 plus years, I think. Um, they get big. Uh, we have 16 types in Louisiana. There's only five types in southwest Louisiana. So you can kind of see where that biogeography is working. We have five types out there, and then when you get all these big river connections, you get a lot more. <coughs> and like I said, car park suckers. Um, ones to point out, you go out to the Pearl, I think they're in most of the strain basins. That one on the right side in the middle, with the stripes, that's a uh, hog sucker, eastern hog sucker maybe, it's a hog sucker, northern, northern hog sucker, yes, I only caught them a few times, that's the one you'll see a lot, you go out to the west, the one to the left of it, those are spotted suckers, you see them all over the state, uh, but the one below is a really special one, and we actually have two species in the state, that's the blue sucker, extremely rare, likes big rivers, doesn't like dams, um, Actually, we dewatered below Toledo Bend, and we moved 87 of those that were stacked up under the dam. And that's the most blue suckers that have ever been seen in one place in Texas or Louisiana, was when we moved them downstream so they didn't die. In the Pearl, you have the southeastern blue sucker. You throw them down together, I couldn't tell them apart. If you go to the Rio Grande, there's a Rio Grande blue sucker. They're just isolated and slightly different. But what's neat about them is most suckers, or most fish in general, have that white belly, that countercurrent shading. So it's a camouflage technique, sharks have it too. So if you look up at it from below, because of the sun, you can't see them. If you look down from the top, they're dark. So they're camouflaged from the top and the bottom. That's why they're white on the bottom and dark on the top. Blue suckers are dark almost uniformly. So you catch this sucker that's like steel blue, and it's beautiful. And they're big and just weird looking. But a very imperiled fish throughout its range. There was one caught in Texas in the Colorado River. They tagged it. <laughs> and this is back before we had these acoustic tags like we do now. So the tagging we're doing, we have receivers out with Bluetooth on them, and the fish swim by and they ping, and it tells you exactly when it swam by and, uh, every, and which fish swam by. But what we used to have to do is radio tags. Those are the ones you always see people chasing around with the antenna. They did that on a blue sucker in the Colorado River in Columbus, Texas, and they caught it under a log. It swam all the way up to the dam in Austin and all the way back, and they re-caught it in the exact same log. It went 300 river miles and it started and ended in the exact same log. So there's a lot to these that we don't understand and uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. Catfish, this is a great family of fish. That's the problem with this talk. I keep saying things are cool and things are great because all fish are cool. I need to stop doing it. But catfish, um, 
Amazing group of fish, a lot of it's underappreciated because we know the big ones, you know, blue cat, channel cat, flathead cat, and mud cat, or bullheads. That's about it that you know inland, and then hardheads and cat tops. We have 14 types of catfish in Louisiana, freshwater catfish. Um, <clears throat> they're from very small, which are the mad toms. So that one on the bottom left is a freckle belly mad tom. We proudly kept that off the endangered species list in the Pearl River and the Bogachita because of protections that are in place and we learned how to catch them. It went from a fish that we never saw to we learned that you need to go in a riffle with a backpack electric fisher on with the same. And this is something we always did in the Texas Hill Country. You just don't do it that much in Louisiana. But they talked to people in Mississippi and realized here's how you catch them. So you use this backpack electro fisher, you shock and you shock into a seine. And you pull them up and that freckle belly magtom was the most abundant fish in a lot of places we sampled. So it got listed as federally threatened in Tennessee and Georgia, but we kept it off the list in Louisiana. So we were doing something right. We're doing a lot of things right. I think. But uh, that's a that's a mad tom. That's a mad tom at the top. That's an adult tadpole mad tom, I think. That's about as big as they get. So mad toms, you could microfish these. If you look, a freckle belly is going to be in rocky riffles, but tadpole mad toms, freckled mad toms, some other types. You're going to find them pretty easily in sluggish water, undercut banks, with vegetation, heavily vegetated. Um, they do use a lot of smell, but I imagine they'll bite whatever comes by them. So you put a little bit of stink bait on a little tiny fly, you might catch one. Um, if you do, be careful. They're called mad toms because they have venom in all their spines. Just like most catfish have venom. You know, you don't want to get popped by a hardhead or even a channel cat. <coughs> These guys are like a bee sting though. And you get it on your knuckle, and it's not going to cripple you or anything, but you'll, you'll feel it for 10 minutes, um, like a bee hitting your knuckle. It hurts. Um, but yeah, that's, that picture, that's me, young me, when I was in school chasing fish. And we were actually shocking in knee-deep water, and there were all these freshwater mussels and big sunfish we were turning up and catching. And that flathead was behind us, and he had a mouthful of freshwater mussels as sunfish. So we, we picked him up, he started throwing up all these fish and mussels. But he was totally taking advantage of us. But yeah, very diverse, very cool, very social. They've done studies on catfish. Um, they recognize individuals. So not to tear your heartstrings when you take that catfish out, you think it's someone's best friend. <laughs> no. But they can recognize individuals and they know who's who and they have social, very complex social interactions. Uh, pickerel. This is one that uh, uh, shocks a lot of people down here. I had a sports rider call a while back in the Pearl River, fished the pearl his whole life, and all of a sudden he's catching these jackfish. He didn't know what they were. He thought we stopped them. I was like, no, they've always been out there. They just boom or bust. If you ever want to get these, Indian Creek Reservoir is full of them. Absolutely full of chain pickerel. So these are pike. There are pike. There are two pike species in Louisiana, like the southern pikes. They're the smallest pikes. Uh, chain pickerel gets up to 24 inches. That's the real jackfish most people see. They'll jump in your boat. They'll hit a uh, spinner bait. They'll hit crank bait. They're just wicked ambush predators. Grass pickerel, a small one. It says up to 14 inches. I've never really seen them bigger than I don't know 10 inches or so. They like vegetation, they like to hide on the edge of weeds, they're ambush predators. Grass pickerel, small water, that undercut bank with terrestrial grass hanging in it, there's a really good chance there's a grass pickerel hanging in there. Um, like I said, they're ambush predators. They have a large mouth, torpedo shape, shape, and they're most closely related to all the fish that we're not talking about today, to salmon and trout. And if you really squint and look at their scales and kind of like, Spin around a couple times, they do look a little bit like a salmon or a trout. What uh, you said, like Indian Creek is loaded with them. I know Chico State Park. Um, I mean, is there any characteristic to those, or is it just the population just outcompetes bass? They just do really random? well at Indian Creek. It's clear water. Yeah. Um, I've never seen so many up Bundick Lake. On certain years, I've seen a bunch, mm -hmm. but then other years you never. See. You can go years without really seeing them, okay. and then all of a sudden they're very boomer bust. It seems. Huh. I had one, one of these actually hit me in a boat. Um, I was, we were electrofish and I was driving behind a console and one of these pickerel came out and like torpedoed straight into me. And, but, um, and do you see them year round? I usually fish for them in colder weather because they seem to tolerate it, but I mean. I'm They'll probably be out and about more in colder weather and maybe easier at night to catch. Mm -hmm. These are ambush predators. Most fish, 
In general, fish don't want to get eaten by birds. General rule, they don't want to die. So at nighttime, fish move out, and they'll be out in the middle in the open. Um, there's a whole different technique to finding them in day and night. Daytime, they're going to be huddled down in that cover. Yeah, like, there's a lot of submerged vegetation where I usually fish for yeah. them, so they just yeah. hang out in that. They'll be right on the edge there, waiting. They also got some good teeth on them. Oh, some of the most fun I've ever had, I was pike fishing up on the border of Canada, <coughs> catching their big relatives. I was catching on like medium bass tackle, these big old things. So it was, that's, that's a blast if you ever get to do that. And they were, they were just biting on rattle traps and spinner baits and stuff. So I imagine the same goes for these. Here's a cool one that's very strange. This is another fish that you'll catch in that sluggish water. Cut banks, vegetation, think pools, think swampy areas. <clears throat> it's a pirate perch. Uh, family Aphrodidaridae. It's the only species in the family. Its closest relatives has some that are above ground. But there's a lot of cave fish, like blind cave fish, up through Arkansas and Missouri that are close relatives. <coughs> to uh, it's a small predator. The big mouth, that one in the hand, is about as big as they get, but they're like all mouth. Um, they're notable for their uh, anus position, which is one of the few things I'll say this about. <coughs> so if you see their species in its name, it's say anus. That's how you remember it, say anus. Because its anus is right here. Most fish anuses will be down here. <coughs> this one's up in its throat, and it migrates. It's got a, I don't know. I guess it's kind of like me coming from Texas, Louisiana. It's a migrating asshole. <laughs> uh, so its anus migrates towards its throat. And we didn't know why um, for years. They finally published a paper, I think early 2000s. They had them in a fish tank with some complex cover. And they figured out what they were doing. They had a male and a female. The male was going head first into a crevice and laying eggs. And the male went through head first and fertilized the eggs into a crevice. So they're crevice spawners in these cut banks, and instead of trying to back into a hole in the bank, they're just going head first and shooting their stuff in there. So that's why they have migrating aids. Only fish that'll have a butt in its throat, so that's a good way to remember it. But if you catch a little one, it won't, so remember that. Um, this would probably be a good one to microfish. They're ambush predators in that sluggish cut bank habitat. I bet you could really entice one of these. In that, that habitat I'm talking about will generally hold Pickerel, um, pirate perch, and mad tongues. You'll see a lot of them in that exact habitat, just waiting to eat stuff. Silver sides. <clears throat> this is a really slender topwater fish. You can buy them as fish food at Petco. Uh, you can fish with them too, I guess. Uh, I never have. They are uh, widely eaten by lots of things. They have two dorsal fins, two distinct dorsal fins. You don't see a whole lot. So you can see they have a first dorsal and a second dorsal that's thin on the back. We have five types in Louisiana. If you really want to get an ID on them, uh, it's not too hard. They'll be listed out in a book. They have pretty distinctive traits. They all kind of look the same until you start kind of peeling back layers and looking at traits. They're different. They're very sensitive fish. Um, the only way I know to keep one alive from the water, if you catch one in the water and do it something else, you never take it out of the water. So you basically and catch it, keep it in the water, put it in a bait bucket. If you want to get it back to your house, put it in a fish tank, put the bait bucket in the water and let it swim out. Something about them hitting there and getting moved around, they, they all die. But a uh, very important fish ecologically, that's a food source. They will be on the top. You can see them all the time eating stuff off the top. So we're wrapping, we're getting to wrap it up, y'all. So nobody stood up and gave me the, yeah, but we're close. Um, live bears. <coughs> These are some of my first loves for fish. Um, I was raising like guppies and sword tails as a kid. Um, was breeding them. Thought it was pretty cool that I could make these fish that will like spawn in a toilet. I thought it was really cool I could spawn in my bedroom. But um, these are mosquito fish, mollies, least killifish. They're related to the popular aquarium fish like I just mentioned. They're ovive of Paris. So they have live babies. Um, but those live babies are not using the mother's uh, nutrients. So they don't have a placenta. They have an egg yolk in there they're feeding off of, but there's a catch to that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, you can tell males from females. That's the sailfin molly up top. The male has a big sailfin, but they have a gonopodium. So if you look at the anal fin on the bottom, 
The males is long and pointy, and the females will fan out. So all these live bears, at least in family facility, the male's anal fin will be long and skinny. A lot of times in certain mosquito fish, especially you go out west, that's how you ID them. You have to look at a male and look at gonopodium under a microscope, because it's a lock and key mechanism. Theoretically, only that gonopodium can mate with the same species. You get a similar species, they don't mix. Doesn't always work, though. Um, mosquito fish is the famous one. It's important for pest control. In my backyard, I have a COVID pond I dug amongst my prairie. It's because I have an area that floods periodically. It's very flooded right now. And then it'll dry up, and all my mosquito fish will dry up and die, and then it'll flood, and I have horrible mosquito problems. Now I have a pond out there, and I make sure it never dries up. So this time of year, you look out in my flooded prairie and it's just rippling with mosquito fish because I'm holding a population. And I haven't used a thermocell or a or off since Hurricane Delta in my house because we do natural mosquito control by promoting dragonflies and aquatic predators like mosquito fish. They've been introduced all over the world um, for that reason. They really do work. So one of my favorites is the least killy fish, that one on the bottom right. It's the smallest fish in North America, it's the seventh smallest fish in the world, and there's a good chance it's in your ditch. Um, you should be proud of it. We're holding a very fantastic fish. They have one baby a day. These live in my living room in a little two and a half gallon planted fish tank with a bunch of shrimp. Um, they're really cool to watch. They're not aggressive like mosquito fish. They have a little bit of pattern. And here's what's the trip about them. I had a professor come down that I never really knew her, but she was from my university my alma mater, and I took, a, I took her out to catch these because she's studying how they pass hormones from mother to baby. And these pass lots of hormones because she's measuring stress hormones. She basically freaks them out. <coughs> they have babies, and she reads the hormones in the babies. But um, these are passing hormones from mother to baby, which you don't see hardly in fish because they don't have a placenta, and they're not feeding off the mom. So if you've got us over here where we're feeding our babies, you have most fish over here with just some egg yolk, these guys are somewhere over here and closer. So very strange stuff going on with them, cool fish. Top minnows, this is probably one you really target, um, micro fishing, fly fishing, because they are easy to see, they're easy to sight fish, you're gonna be on the top, eating bugs, eating stuff that falls in the water. If you're eating a granola bar and you throw it in there, you can watch them swarm it. Um, we have 15 types of fungulids, so there's going to be two families, top minnows and pupfish. Fungulids will be the true top minnows, pupfish are saprinodonts, that's a sheep's head minnow. So we have 15 types of true top minnows, fungulids, which will be everything except for that dumpy guy in the middle, that's a sheep's head minnow. From um, their habitat specialists on them, some are very generalist, some have very narrow habitats, some are all over the place. Um, but if you catch a fish, a lot of times they have kind of a reflective star or reflective scale on their head that you can see, and they'll be on the top. So that's, you get one of those in your hand, you know where to start. Um, two of the ones I see commonly in southwest Louisiana are on the, the top two on the right. They look very similar, but that top one is a Blair's top minnow. It's going to be yellow with beautiful red spotted stripes going down it. And the bottom one's a golden top minnow, which is very gold. They also have red spots, but you can see the trait I'm looking for, the stripes aren't in neat lines. Like if you're looking at striped bass and white bass, you look at the line shape. Same thing here. Neat lines be Blair's starhead top minnow, which there's an eastern and a western one. I think it's not eye out here. So it looks exactly like that. And golden, you probably get both of those. One below that, um, Easily mistaken for mosquito fish, but it's actually a top minnow that lays eggs. It's a rainwater killifish. It gets that big. It's a little tiny guy. Uh, sheep's head minnows are pretty amazing. If you go out west, there's a lot of diversity of pupfish, Red River pupfish, got uh, Comanche Springs pupfish, and the Devil's Hole pupfish, one of the most endangered fish in the, in the world. It's only in one little hole. They are very tolerant. Uh, sheep's head minnow and pupfish. I've caught, well, you see them on the coast, and you see them in drying up, basically salt ditches. So they can have extreme fresh water, extreme cold, extreme heat, extreme salt. Places I've caught pupfish in the panhandle of Texas, and the headwaters of the red. If you ever go up there, this is like old Comanche territory, it's uh, salt flats. It smells like the coast. It smells like the South Texas coast in the summer, and you're walking on pure salt. And you're crunching until you get in water that doesn't really go over the soles of your shoes and Red River pupfish are in there just having the time of their lives. 
<coughs> it's not that they necessarily like hypersaline water that's 105 degrees. It's nothing else can live with them, so they're having a great time. But once the conditions get better, <coughs> they can't compete with other species very well, so they disappear. All right, a couple more slides. <coughs> These are tempered basses, moronids. This is uh, stripers, white bass, yellow bass, hybrid stripers. Uh, I think white perch, as you get up north, true white perch, not what we call white perch. Um, they do have spawning migration, some from the ocean end, like striped stripe bass, some are just riverine. White bass run was a real big thing when I was a kid. I'd go with my, grand, my granddad in Lake Livingston, and we'd hit the white bass run every year. Um, really big deal. Yellow bass are going to be locally very common. Looks a lot like a white bass, but smaller and yellow. Uh, various popular sport fish. Uh, we get lots of questions on telling hybrids from stripers from whites, and it's always a headache. So if you ever have the question, don't email me, because all I'm going to do is pull that up. And you can pull that up, too. You want to look at a tooth patch. And a lot of times we get pictures in, we can't look at the tooth patch in the mouth from a picture. So we give a lot of questions like, that's eh, probably this. A, a real true striper is pretty obvious, but everything in between that is gets tricky sometimes, especially with bad photography. Do you know? I know a lot of people in Texas, like you mentioned, fish the white bass run. It seems less people in Louisiana do we just not have the right habitat, or just it's just it like might modular. just be a cultural thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, a lot of and white bass in Texas were stocked in general, as far as I understood from <coughs> thesis work. Everything, uh, all the white bass, I think not in the Red River, but west of the Red River, they were historically out there, like prehistorically out there in the fossil record, mm -hmm. even in like Lubbock. They found white bass skeletons, but I don't think there are native white bass in Texas that made it through the Pleistocene, but they've been restocked because they put all those reservoirs in and stuff. A lot of fishing is just cultural. Why people chase what? I mean, what we eat, what we don't eat, what we fish for. I mean, there wasn't a tarpon fishery in South Louisiana with, until people came from somewhere else. We're like, y'all are sitting on a ton of tarpon before they wrecked everything. But, um, it was just cultural. They never thought to catch these giant fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're getting to sunfishes. I think this is what Dugan wanted me out here originally for, so we'll talk about them. Um, sunfishes, very cool, uh, very diverse group. Uh, some are popular sport fish, a lot aren't. The ones that aren't, I think, are generally a lot more beautiful to look at. Uh, they have one dorsal fin, they have spiny rays in the front, and soft rays in the back. Um, if you ever held one, you'll know that. Uh, they build nests, they have very complex parental care, they're good parents. Um, so we're going to start in evolutionary order and how to look at these. So it's pretty wild. The trick with sunfish, you want to see when their ancestors evolved a trait of anal spines. The oldest uh, kind of ancestral looking sunfish that we have is a flyer. It has eight anal spines. Flyers are going to be found in that same habitat I keep hitting on with the pickerel and the pirate perch. Think of a small one. I've also caught them in swamps. I've caught them in swamps a lot of places. But think small creek, sluggish pool, deep pool, maybe deeper, shallow water feeding into it, vegetation growing over it. It's going to have flyers in it, probably. A tan and stained sluggish pool. Flyers are fun. They do fly, they jump. Um, but yeah, if you count the anal spines, you'll know it is not your regular sunfish. Because your regular sunfish have three, the lapomus that we're all used to. So if we're going to go up, so we have uh, two species of crappie in Louisiana, white crappie and black crappie. There's two traits that I really look for with crappie. So we have one state fish, which is actually, our state fish is a crappie, which is actually two state fish. So we got like a two for one deal. So we have black crappie on the left, white crappie on the right. I always describe the pattern on a black crappie as more of a checkerboard, when a white crappie is going to have more striping, more uh, vertical striping. But the real key is the black crappie has more dorsal spines. Don't quote me on the counts, I want to say it's like eight or nine, and then white crappie have maybe six. But what it means is white crappie have fewer dorsal spines on their dorsal fin. And what it looks like, if you have them side by side especially, is a white crappie has a receding hairline, and a black crappie doesn't. And that's how I learned it, and it's stuck. And it works. It's a receding hairline on a white crop. It's six or less on a white and seven or more on a black. Yeah, I was close. 
<laughs> um, so, so that trait popped up later. We went from sunfish, you know, I don't know, uh, 30, 40, 50 million years ago having eight anal spines. Now somebody had six. They split off into a couple crappie and they split off into rock bass. Uh, you have rock bass out in this part of the state. Uh, shadow bass in other parts of the country, very hard to tell apart. They're amblyplites. Um, six anal spines. It looks like a warmouth, but it's not. And if you get confused between a rock bass and a warmouth, warmouth is a lipomus. Uh, warmouth is actually right above it. So if you look right above that circled one, they could be confused. Count the anal spines. Six on a rock bass. It's a more ancient trait. Then these are all lipomus. Those are the typical sunfish you get. Green sunfish, long ear sunfish, bluegill. Um, on and on from a very small bantam sunfish, which in my little ditch is the most abundant fish most years, to a uh, really big red ear sunfish, stump knocker, shell cracker, red ears. Um, Warmouth is down there in the bottom left, it's piscivorous, so it has a big mouth, it's eating other fish. A lot of sunfish diversity is driven by what they eat, so like bluegill eat invertebrates, red ears will eat, uh, they prefer snails and warm mouse and green sunfish like fish. And they've done studies where if you have them in a pond with just bluegill, they're gonna eat everything. They're gonna be eating snails and inverts and fish. But when you pack them together with those three species, they partition off. And the, sun, the bluegills will only be eating invertebrates, the warm mouse are only eating fish, and the red ears are only eating um, shellfish, I guess. Or uh, not shellfish, mollusks. So they're very plastic in how they eat. And it's form and function. You can look at their mouth and kind of imagine what they're going to be eating by the size of their mouth. And their pharyngeal teeth. Some fish, like redfish, I was always told don't put your hand in the redfish because it's got crab crunchers. Those are pharyngeal teeth. So we can tell that. You'll see it looks like fingers coming off their gill arch. And that's a filter. So fish that eat really small stuff, like a paddlefish is eating plankton, it's like a fine, fine tooth comb. But if you have fish that are eating like big fish, they don't need to filter all that small stuff, so they have really big, widely spaced gill rakers. They're sometimes nubby. Um, you can tell a lot about what they're eating by looking at their mouth and their gill rakers. So hopefully you've learned to look at sunfish. <laughs> um, the other sunfish we didn't talk about yet is the largemouth bass, Micropterus. They also have three anal spines. All a black bass is is a, you know, gussied up sunfish. It's just gotten longer, it's gotten a bigger mouth, it eats fish. It's kind of the hyper version of what a warm mouth is. It's just it's more evolved to eat fish. But in the end they are just sunfish. So this is really cool. So I was talking, I was thinking the other day, I just added this about uh, the anal spines and how they work out evolutionarily. And this came out from Tom Near and uh, I forget his first name, Kim. They work at Yale. And they do lots of fish genetics. They look at a lot of the evolutionary history of fish. One thing that's cool about sunfish, and it's rare, we have for freshwater fish, we have a really good fossil record. So a lot of these guys with the cross on them, those are all extinct uh, fish that we have fossils of. We can look at how old a fossil is by where it is in strata. And there's other uh, ways to look at ages and they'll different isotope aging. Everybody knows about carbon-14 dating. This will be older than carbon-14. There's other isotopes they look at. But they can get a pretty good idea of where these fossil fish came from, how I many millions of years ago. So we're looking at the earliest Micropterus was 15 million years ago. They think they split off. So these are uh, bass or Micropterus. These are Lipomus, the rest of the sunfish. They think they split off 25 to 30 million years ago. But um, what they did is they looked at fossils, they looked at morphometrics, so all the measurements, all the ways we've historically ID'd fish and found relationships, and they looked at genetics. And they put all those lines of evidence together and pretty much came up with the family tree of sunfish, which is really cool. You can see early on, 40 million years ago, the ancestor of crappie and our other sunfish split off 40 million years ago. But from the crappie, you also get the splits of uh, Amblyplites and the Centrarchus, so you get the flyers, you get the rock bass. They came from the same family group as, or the same group as uh, <coughs> crappie. Lipomus, if you really zoom into this, you can see all the relationships with what we call sister taxa, how 
they're most closely related. Some are really obvious, some aren't. So the one that really jumps out at me, um, if we look up here, Lipoma symmetrica, cyanel sigillosa. Cyanel sigillosa, that's a green sunfish in the warm mouth. Big fish eaters, big sunfish. A friend of mine, a retired English teacher named Norman German, out in southwest Louisiana, he was out in Lake Charles, big fisherman. He said, he, uh, I put a picture of a bantam sunfish up one day, because I got them all over my place. And he said, uh, is that a green sunfish or a warm mouth or something? I was like, no, man, it's a little bantam sunfish. But right then, this had just come out, and I went, dude, you're a genius. Because the bantam sunfish, the little tiny guy, is most closely related to the green sunfish in the warm mouth. I wouldn't even think of that. My brain is so biased against that, I wasn't seeing it. But him pretty much coming in with like a baby's ignorance on what this fish was, saw the relationship there that I can't see anymore. So all that tuning your eyes, sometimes you have to forget all your tuning to see something. But um, a lot of fascinating <coughs> stuff. You can find this. You just search Near and Kim on Google, Near and Kim 2021. You can get a high resolution of that if you're really into sunfish family trees. So the final sunfish <coughs> that was not on the family tree, but Tom Near did confirm to me that it probably is part of that sunfish family we looked at, is the diminutive pygmy sunfish. Another one of my favorite fish. Another one I'm proud to say is my yard fish. And I also go to Bayou Lacassine. We can catch 15 of these in a dip. It's pretty cool. This is a tiny, tiny fish. It's like that big. It looks like mulch if you catch them. They will lie still. They will not move. And they will look like a little brown piece of mulch lying there. But they can be beautiful fish. The males get a little color. If you go out to Florida, you ones have blue spots all over them. So the banded piggy sunfish, the one we have, <coughs> the, they were in their, they were in the centrarchid family officially early 2000s. And when I got in school, they got kicked out of the centrarchid family. And now they're getting let back <coughs> in the centrarchid family. We don't know where they are. There were lots of questions for genetics. They were related to stuff totally different. But they are sunfish. They're tiny, they're hiding in that vegetation. Invertivores. <coughs> they say they get up to two inches. I've never seen them that big. It's an inch and a half at the most, usually. Um, they do have parental care, the male's guard nest. And when we go back to anal spines, they have three anal spines, like lapomus and like bass, like black bass. So you can maybe get an idea of where they split off or how they're related to those other fish. But two more slides. We've got darters. Darters are a fantastic, diverse, beautiful group of fish. They're benthic, meaning they live on the bottom. They reduce swim bladders, so they don't float that well. They kind of have to fight to get up. Um, they have subterminal mouths. They have two dorsal fins, kind of like the silver sides. Um, they're invertivores, so they're always eating worms, other microinvertebrates or macroinvertebrates in the water, uh, usually on the bottom. You see a lot of types in swift water. Um, you also see a lot of types of sluggish water. Their names kind of tell you a lot. We've got slew darter, mud darter, um, sand darters. <laughs> I mean, they kind of tell you where they're found. Um, the highest diversity is we're talking about Alabama early. In the Appala Appalachian Mountains, um, Alabama, West Virginia, Tennessee, crazy <coughs> water diversity. Um, they're hard to ID. A lot of them you're looking at like pores in their head and how to ID them or how many, what kind of scales they have on their neck. And this is a fish that's big, you're looking at neck scales. Um, some are extremely colorful, uh, others are real strikingly patterned. If you want to catch these, hit bottom habitats with some little wormy looking thing. I don't know how, I, I'm guessing they're pretty visual, I don't know. Um, if you keep fish tanks, these are really cool in fish tanks, they're very social fish, they're very charismatic. And uh, they're related to walleyes. So Sauger and walleye are in the darter family. Um, it's really the perch family. You see their name is Persity. So I grew up calling brim sunfish perch, or perch fishing. But then you go get that beaten out of you if you go get a degree in this stuff, because these are perch. Persity means true perch. So I, I can't say perch anymore. It's kind of like wearing a hat at the table. I can't wear a hat at the table because I feel my mom like hitting me. <laughs> so the last one we're going to get into is drum. Um, we have a freshwater drum in Louisiana. It's called Goo, gas for Goo. Uh, has a subterminal mouth. Same family as the marine drums. Um, the way you tell a drum is that lateral line on the tail, that lateral line is those sensory pores that go down the side of a fish. 
and a drum, it goes all the way through the tail. And you can kind of see it on the top left one. It has that line kind of going in the tail. If you hold one, you'll see there's little pores going down the tail. So we have other drums that people don't know are drums. You know, croaker is a drum. Um, red drum, red fisher drum, but speckled trout are drum. So they're in the same family. Speckled trout is not a trout. It looks like a trout, so we call it a trout. But speckled trout is very close related to this. Much more close related to this than just about anything else outside the family. And you can tell if you catch a trout and look at its tail, it has a line of pores going down it. Um, they eat invertebrates and mussels. There's a very popular spawning around the Calcasieu. They go catch ditch crawfish and they'll fish the Calcasieu. And I've met people from like Bill Platt and Eunice out fishing the Calcasieu. Usually the heavy, heavy accent that is tough to understand, but they're out there chasing the drum. Um, and that's all I got. I'll look at these books real quick. If we got, I really went over. But um, so what I hope to do here is kind of get you thinking about families of fish, a starting point. Um, I'm really into plants. A lot of how I deplant plants, just knowing that's a cone flower, and I go from there. Here's where I am. Here's what's blooming. I do the same thing with fish. Unfortunately. We do have a book of fish in Louisiana. Neil Douglas wrote it. Neil Douglas is one of the godfathers of fish in Louisiana. He's actually still alive. It's a good book, but unfortunately it was written in the 70s. It's extremely outdated. We know a lot more about fish, what we have, and where they are than they did in the 70s. We've done a lot of fish work. And unfortunately it's out of print. I just looked. You can't find a used one. You can't find it for under 80 bucks. So I'm going to lock this away. <laughs> let my eye off. It is a great book, though, if you want the quick and dirty. Here's where I am, here's what fish might be here. This will do it. There's a lot of online resources like Fish Base or Fishnet 2 is a good way to see where fish are. Um, I did just email uh, Joe a copy of the updated list of fish in Louisiana. So hopefully he'll give that to you. It's a published from Professor at Tulane, Hank Bart. He curates all the fish. We have one of the biggest fish collections in the world at Tulane in old like bunkers and, and ammunition stores from World War II. It's post-apocalyptic, it's crazy, and they have millions of fish. Um, but it's Hank Bart and Kyle Pillar from Southeastern Rhodes. And it's by family by family, all the fish we know occur in freshwater in Louisiana. It's a good starting point. So books I use in the field, this is what I will not go anywhere without if I go in the field. It's uh, the Freshwater Fish of Texas. It works in the western part of the state. Like I told you before, I come from the lineage of people that wrote this, and they taught me how to field ID fish. And this will also teach you how to field ID fish. It teaches you the traits as much as you can from a book, it teaches you the traits to hone in on. It also comes from this Texas Journal of Science. This is a scientific key of the fish of Texas. If you really want to get down into it, you get a key, and you key your fish out based on traits. So since we don't have a good up-to-date Fishes of Louisiana book, there's a Fish of Arkansas book really covers a whole lot of states, especially the northern part. We have inland fish in Mississippi. I'm not sure how much either of these cost. I haven't had to buy them, but um, this is a really good one too. These are excellent books. They do have keys to families at least. They do have keys to species. They have range maps within Mississippi, they have pictures, and they have a lot of uh, just facts about the fish, biological facts. This is my favorite fish ID book. If you want to learn how to ID fish and what to look for, well, this book is Fish of Missouri, and this is the old version, which is a whole lot cheaper than the new version. It's about the same. They have these line drawings where they can really highlight traits. So when they're telling you a scale looks like this, or the mouth looks like this, or the gill flap looks like this, one looks like a half moon and one looks like a quarter moon, <coughs> this book shows you all that. And when I was just really teaching myself <coughs> and learning how to ID fish, I leaned on that. But, uh, those are the tools you can hopefully use. Um, you can always email me. <coughs> My email's not up there. If you get fish, you don't know what they are. <coughs> oh, sorry. I think I've hit my limit today. Uh, so if you have questionable fish, you can email me there. Tell me where you were and send me a good picture, diagnostic picture. Don't like a, not a blurry picture on a hook hanging out. Like have it in your hand or on the ground where I can really <coughs> see the full side of it. 
and even a couple different angles you can do it. But if you want me to help you idea fish, if I can't do it, I'll give some out of can. So. Jeff, yeah. any questions? Cool, I said it all. <laughs> well, thanks, y'all. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you.